Good afternoon, and thanks for all the players who've made this event possible. Uh, today, our panel faces the really daunting challenge of trying to address regulation, responses, and partnerships in the span of about an hour, especially now that we're, we're trucking through pretty quickly. Um, thankfully, I think our panelists are up for the challenge. So to lay the scene, we're lucky to follow this last, this last chat, which has really highlighted the current state of play from the industry's perspective. But now I think it's time to turn to what uh, other stakeholders can do, and especially start to ask how they plan to mitigate these problems and practice good governance at the same time. So the balance of security, privacy, and free expression is something that requires a lot of practice and discipline. And I think that decision makers must continually ask some of the following questions. What are we willing to give? What do we need to protect? How do we make sure the cost of our solutions don't outweigh the benefits? What are the mandates necessary for actual change and not just uh, sort of giving lip service to these issues? So to help calibrate the scales and highlight the considerations um, that we're looking at concerning regulation, legislation, as well as partnership and other responses, I'm going to turn it over to our three panelists. I just stand up, say what we gotta do, and then I assign it to them, not myself. Uh, so first, we have uh, Lieutenant Colonel Reserves, uh, Yuri Binyakov. Um, he is the Director of Development, a senior researcher, and in, uh, the Institute's representative to the Israeli, or Israeli Parliament for Counterterrorism Law at ICT. Uh, today, Yaakov will discuss the ways of encouraging cooperation in legislative regulation of cyber exploitation has a great cadence to it. Next, we have Florence Keen, a research fellow with Rusi's Center for Financial Crime and Security Studies. Her work will focus on public private sector responses to financial crime. And today, Ms. Keen will speak about um, public private partnerships and learning lessons from counterterrorist finance. And lastly, but certainly not least, we have Alistair Reed. Uh, Dr. Alistair Reed is a research fellow and the former director of ICCT uh, in De Hague. And today, Dr. Reed will discuss post-terrorist incident communications. So although it's really hard to get to the nitty gritty components of things like legislation and the time allotted, I think we can begin to talk about the tenants that we need, especially within governments, to sort of undergird the policies we need to begin uh, developing. So with that, I'm going to turn over the podium and our speakers will come up one at a time and then we'll step up onto the stage for a conversation afterwards. So thank you. So, some of the slides I won't present because it was presented before. Uh, our primary aim in the research um, is to identify key areas of cooperation among stakeholders. The idea was to facilitate uh, such cooperation by highlighting similarities and differences in regul regulatory measures across 10 uh, uh, terrorist use of internet categories that I will present shortly. The project actually contained two main elements. One of them was a website, and the other one, uh, which is still on process, is a policy paper. You can see here, this is uh, part of our website presenting uh, regulatory measures such as laws, uh, strategies, policies, treaties, international protocols, uh, resolutions, public uh, declarations, research policies identified by social media platforms. We'll go over it uh, in a second, but uh, basically uh, the project utilized a qualitative methodology uh, of all of the above, uh, we complied it from five uh, different uh, countries, US, UK, Israel, Germany, and France, six international organizations, the UN, NATO, uh, the EU, OSCE, Interpol, and Europol, and five social media platforms, Facebook, Google, Twitter, Microsoft, and YouTube. 
the second part, as I said, is the policy paper. The other, it's the other element of the research, which should highlight basically a set of recommendations for leveraging the lesson learned from the regulatory models. Uh, and we do hope and believe that uh, it won't get the usual treatment that uh, such policy papers are getting from decision makers. Uh, those are the 10 categories. Be patient, it took me time to, to do it. <laughs> we won't go one by one into it, but uh, those are the 10 categories that uh, we decided on. Um, all of them has to do with tourism use of internet. Not all of them has to do with, with uh, I would say, with social uh, networks or social medias. And as you can see, we put also uh, cyber attacks as part of it, and I will elaborate in a minute. This is part of the methodology. You can see here the, the five countries that uh, we worked on, the different categories, and each category got a specific grade between one to five based on the fact whether the national laws addressing this specific use on it of internet and whether it applies for both the physical world as well as to the cyber world. Now, maybe it's not important, but it's, it's important for me. I'm presenting this slide to emphasize the need of cooperation, not the importance. What I would like to claim is that there is no way to counter terrorism on the cyber world without deep cooperation, meaning to say it's a must. It's an uh, old uh, ancient uh, story about uh, a village of uh, blind people that went to a tour in the jungle and uh, bumped into an elephant. They are blind, they didn't know that it's an elephant, and each one of them touched a different part of the elephant body. The whole idea here is if they won't share the information between themselves, if they will not talk to each other, there is no way whatsoever that they will discover that's an elephant. Now I'm getting messages that <laughs> I need to finish, so I will try to do it fast. Challenges, definition of terrorism, I think that Irene talked about it uh, a lot. Budgetary allocations. The balance between uh, democratic values and LIA's requirements need, it was also on spot. You can see the both circles. On the left side, the state responsibility for the citizen security. On the right side, the state need also uh, to uphold uh, the Constitution and to keep the human rights. And as you can see here, the overlapping is quite small. And different states are willing to sacrifice different values, and this is one of the main obstacles for international cooperation. Um, there is uh, another uh, challenge which have, has to do with, with the distinction between uh, the terrorist content and legitimate one. I will show you a few examples. The youngsters among us can identify Call of Duty, but this is Call of Jihad. Everything is real. Uh, this is the seven uh, film, and this is James Foley execution. This is Mr. Robot, and similar, this is Mr. Thor. This is recruitment for the German army, and this is recruitment for Jihad. This is a short video that uh, that you will see shortly, it's a suicide bomber. And actually it seems like you know what like, but the truth is that 
Yeah. So this is another challenge, a real one. Languages mix English, Arabic, Arabic in terms of English, and vice versa. False positive. This is the. <laughs> this is. This is a Tawhid. Uh, in those cases, it's easy to identify jihadists and non-jihadists. But in this case, if you don't have anything else you won't recognize, now you will recognize because of ISIS flag. And here, it looks like it's not terrorist, but we know him. It's a terrorist, false positive. Here you can see Stevie, uh, my colleague from uh, ICT, writing something, CNN. A lot of challenges, not easy. But we are here in order to discuss cooperation. And one good example is what the EU is doing uh, now. You can see here uh, a key European uh, legal uh, instrument dealing with all terrorist use of internet, including radicalization, which was not found to be addressed in the national laws. And another proposal that we do hope that uh, will become a law in which uh, the, the social networks will have to take down uh, terrorist contact within one hour after uh, they will be informed by the relevant law enforcement agency. Key findings and recommendations of our research focus on key areas where there is a high potential for strengthening counterterrorism cooperation, according to the categories that we saw before, which are most likely to be a fruits, emphasize a multi-stakeholder engagement to ensure effective national and international counterterrorism cooperation. Uh, Actually, we are participating in another project called Red Alert, financed by the EU Horizon 2020, in which uh, we are trying to do two things. First of all, to uh, produce a tool that will help in early detection of radicalization. And then the most important thing, in my point of view, is to serve as a platform for different LIAs uh, to use uh, the same tool and to share information, posts, etc., etc. A further joint uh, use and development of uh, technological tools, which is very important. Implement modes of information sharing around regulatory measures and practices. This is actually this project, ICTRP. And developing measure and tools for cybersecurity, including measure and tools that will deal with cyber attacks. Thank you very much. Hi, um, thank you all so much for having me. I'm Florence Keane. I'm a research fellow at RUSI. And I've been looking at the topic from a potentially quite niche angle in what really we can learn from the counter-terrorist financing world, who've had a real history over the past 20 or so years of, of a relationship with law enforcement, both in a, a regulatory, um, very strict sense, um, and increasingly in public-private collaboration, which is a sort of growing trend in financial crime as a more, more effective way in dealing with threats. And um, as we sort of began to think about this problem and, and the GIF-CT's focus on public-private public partnership, we felt that there were many kind of parallels that could be drawn um, from our lessons in counter-terrorist financing. So not to directly pull from them, but also to think of um, some of the real unintended consequences as well that haven't necessarily been solved. And ultimately, I would hope that in 20 years' time, we're not having the same conversations in the social media um, and internet space. Um, so that's the kind of genesis of it. As I said, significant parallels, which I'll touch upon briefly, and this emerging trend towards public-private collaboration. We did a, a very quick three-month study where we conducted semi-structured interviews with kind of relevant law enforcement and tech partners, some of whom are in the room. 
um, and a, a comparative study between the two. And it was quite good as a researcher to have it, this kind of limited focus uh, with quick policy recommendations that we hope can be easily implemented. I'm not so sure how well you can see this slide, so I won't go on about it for too long, but this is really where we started with our kind of similarities and differences between the two sectors. I mean, clearly beginning with the fact that both social media um, and communication service providers, um, similarly to the financial system, are, are mostly used for legitimate purposes, but we know there's a small element of it that may be vulnerable to terrorist use. Um, and in that instance, we see private sector companies acting as nodes or, or conduits for certain activities that in the financial world, banks have been placed with a real heightened responsibility since 9-11 to detect and disrupt um, suspicious activity on their platforms. Um, clearly born out of 9-11 and, and a real, what we would argue was quite a reactive response in um, the fact that approximately $300,000 flow through the formal financial system and governments around the world really felt that they needed to do something immediately and we have a host of, uh, of FATF recommendations and UN Security Council resolutions that really target the banks as that frontline piece and um, I would argue that there's a, a similar drive perhaps now looking at communication service providers as what more can they do and how can governments respond to that. There's similar implementation challenges, of course. We've spoken a lot about uncertainty around definitions, so I'm not going to mention that again. The financial industry has a commitment to financial inclusion as well and not exiting people out of the financial system. And we know that you know, technology is really important for reaching actors that often are marginalised. And I think the same is clear for communication service providers as well, acknowledging how crucial in recent years the internet and social media has been for often marginalised voices and human rights advocates. And really prioritising that space is clearly crucial. And again, as has already been mentioned, there's such a diversity of platforms, both in finance and in communication service providers. You know, we, as we've said before, don't use one app. We also may not use one form of financial system. Sometimes we pay friends in cash. Sometimes we use our fintech card, and sometimes it's a traditional banking system. And of course, terrorists are very much the same in both instances. And finally, we have this sort of growing range of initiatives that are focused on preventing uh, the dissemination of terrorist content, which we've spoken about in great, great length. Um, and sim similarly, the financial institution uh, world focuses on this too. And as I've said, greater focus on public-private partnership in detecting that threat. So to begin with uh, what I think is just a really crucial debate, and I'm not convinced is being had yet, is the unintended consequences of regulation. Regulatory pressure, as we know, can produce these kind of counterproductive measures and learning from the financial sector. We know that, you know, there's this huge burden that's been placed on them and we see you know, massive over-reporting and, and really law enforcement all over the world are unable to deal with the amount of suspicious transaction reports that come through their door. So, you know, I would argue really strongly against seeing that kind of regulatory system introduced to the communication service provider world when there's no real measure of if that kind of compliance system is that effective in preventing terrorist financing. We've spoken a bit about fines and we can maybe talk in more detail on the panel about some of the recent you know, proposed European regulations. We have our own white paper in the UK and they talk about the levying of fines if, if content hasn't been removed within an hour. And I'm not arguing necessarily that fines are always a bad thing, but again, fines don't always achieve desired outcomes, um, especially if we don't clearly define what the company has done wrong. We know that in the banking world, the big banks can just you know, take these, these fines on and kind of get on with their day, and I won't mention their names. Whereas smaller, smaller banks and small fintech companies may not be able to shoulder that burden, and that's something that we really need to think about. Risk displacement, again, the perception is that if regulated spaces become more efficient, there are weaker links, maybe outside of regulatory scope, or maybe um, you know, two or three guys who lack the resources to deal with the problem on their platform. So again, thinking about that weakest link and, and making sure that we're focusing our conversation not just on the big platforms, but on the smaller platforms as well, and how we can disseminate knowledge. Touch upon effectiveness, because I'm kind of obsessed with that in the counter-terrorist financing world. I don't think we have a clear measure on what effectiveness really looks like and reading some of the literature now when it comes to communication service providers I hear a rhetoric of you know introducing a risk-based approach and, and, and accountability measures and again what do these things really mean and I think that needs to be more clearly defined in both spaces and my big bugbear is the potential of government abuse on regulations and 
I've worked in that space on the counter-terrorist financing world, and we've seen that there's a raft of um, you know, resolutions and financial action task force recommendations that have been um, very much exploited and interpreted for the purposes of, of governments who want to clamp down on civil society. And that's clearly so pertinent when we think about the tech and the communication service provider space. As I've already mentioned, we need these spaces for people to send their message across. And kind of vague, unclear regulation in the wrong hands can have uh, really dangerous consequences, which again, I'd be happy to talk about a bit more in the panel. So just to run through what we see as potential objectives to public-private collaboration as opposed to strict regulation. Um, my, my timer is almost up, so I'll, I'll try and run through this quickly. Um, so we really see this great benefit in increasing partnership between the public and private sector. And this doesn't necessarily need to begin at operational information. This can merely be communities sitting together and having a discussion about shared trends and typologies. Um, and, and not just thinking about content removal, some of the things I've listed there on factors leading to radicalization, maybe context as to why a certain group is prescribed, um, hashtags, slogans, which again, I think are already being shared and that's extremely positive. Um, never to forget important points about data protection, proportionality and accountability, um, which I'll maybe go into more detail uh, in the panel. And I can also perhaps talk about the UK's experience with their counter-terrorist financing partnership uh, known as the GIMLIT, which is another good acronym. And my final point um, to, to consider when thinking about a collaborative model um, as I've said, thinking about the legal and practical ways to share information, which is why I would advise in the first instance when thinking about bringing social media and tech companies into the um, field with law enforcement, it may not start at operational measures, particularly as we have this diverse range of actors who come from different countries and you wouldn't want to stop entry um, just because of you know, different regulations. Um, considering best practices, of course, and that membership is kind of voluntary and flexible and extends not only to the um, private sector, but also bringing in those civil society actors as well, whose voices are often forgotten, and that's perhaps a criticism of the counter-terrorist financing regime as well. Ultimately, um, a public-private kind of working group and collaborative mechanism isn't a substitute for regulation, and um, I don't want to sit here and say I disagree with regulation, but regulation needs to be clearly clarified, and, and really public-private collaboration can be a complement so long as it's clearly defined. Um, we have another piece of research coming, but I won't go into that now because it's not been published yet, but happy to talk offline about that. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you very much to um, Rusi Brookings and GIF CT for giving me this opportunity to speak, and also to... Um, my fellow panelists for their fascinating pan, um, presentations. What I'm going to talk to about today is work with research I've recently started with um, Harara Ingram, who was chairing the first panel on post incident communications. And I'm going to start with our conclusion. At the end of it, we call for a paradigm shift in CTCV stratcoms to incorporate post incident communications. And this is really our attempt to try and move the conversation on and to bring it out that there's more to stratcoms than just counter-narratives. And to go back to the beginning, you know, think about it, terrorism is inherently communicative. Terrorists put a bomb in a cafe, not primarily to kill the people in the cafe, but to kill the people in the cafe to terrorize a wide audience or to incite or inspire a wide audience. And fundamentally, this is done through shaping perceptions and meaning forming. And we call for reconceptualizing how we see terrorist incidents and to view them through the lens of meaning generation. Whether you have the impact of terrorizing a population or inciting depends on how that meaning has been formed. Now, traditionally, CT policy is largely focused on and using stratcoms just as a means of countering recruitment and radicalization, so-called downstream. But we argue that there should be actually a focus on the upstream, on post instance communications to help shape this meaning generation and to reduce the impacts of these terrorist attacks once they've happened and to help shape the response and reduce the social harm. Now, social media has fundamentally changed the communications landscape. And in terms of crisis communication, has, been, has become a part of this new media ecology. And when, there's one particular impact in that it essentially bypasses the media, traditional media gatekeepers, 
which means that you have an unfiltered flow of communications. Now, in the post-instant space, social media brings a whole load of positives and a whole load of negatives. And the key is how can we accentuate the positives and minimize the negatives? Now, I'm just going to sketch out the scale of the challenge that we face. If we think about in the immediate aftermath of an attack, in the seconds and minutes afterwards, the public has used social media as a means to communicate with each other, to let people know they're OK, to find out information, and so on. But this unfiltered flow of information has also made this become the perfect breeding ground for rumors and misinformation. And if we look at terrorist attacks such as the Manchester Arena attack um, after the concert of Ariande Grande, I think I pronounced that right. I'm, I'm too old to know. Um, within the, immediately after that, there's rumors circulating that there's actually gunmen at the hospital. And that meant that the emergency response was held back behind the cordon until we actually managed to clear that that was not the case. We've also had situations where rumors spreading quickly on social media have turned instances which weren't terrorists into potential terrorist incidents or perceived. We have a famous case on Oxford Street in, um, in London where an incident between two men on the, on the, on the metro led to a spiraling of rumors and people um, calling the police and saying that there was gunshots and there was uh, vehicle-borne attack and led to a full um, counter-terrorism response, but it was actually just a fight which led to a whole series of rumors. But in the end, central London was still locked down until that was clarified. We've also seen in the Mumbai attack how terrorists have used social media as a tactical tool to be able to see where people are, to follow the members of the public online, to find out where people are, to go and attack them. And it's also become an important tool, if used correctly, by police and emergency services to be able to communicate directly to members of the public, to update them, also a source of intelligence against situational awareness. And it's also very good for organizing um, members of the public. After the Oslo attack, it was used to coordinate blood donors going to hospitals. But fundamentally, after an attack, there's a vacuum which will be filled by social media one way or another. And the less emergency services act promptly and fill that vacuum will be filled by others. The next point I want to talk about after the immediate aftermath is the battle, what we call the battle to frame terrorist attacks. On the one hand, you obviously have the terrorists who aim to frame their attack. In previous years, in previous decades, terrorists have had to manipulate the media to cover their attacks. Now they don't need the media to be there. We just need a member of public with their iPhone. We saw after the Lee Rigby attack in London, after they um, nearly cut off his head, they um, sought out members of the public to give statements to him and the famous images of him holding a knife and a hands covered in blood justifying the attack. It wasn't long before terrorists moved on to doing it themselves and we had um, terrorists live tweeting during the Westgate attack and then most recently with the Christchurch attack which really brought it to a whole new level. Everything about the planning of that attack was to make sure it went viral online. But we also have other actors who compete to framing it. One of them is um, other extremist groups who try to exploit the situation. Going back to the Lee Rigby example, in the immediate aftermath of that, you had the English Defence League, a far-right organisation in the UK, tweeting out and saying, framing it as, this is at, we are under attack from Islam, and framing it in such a way to try and provoke retaliatory attacks. And we tend to see a spike in hate crimes due to this after attacks. But also so after Christchurch, ISIS trying to frame Christchurch and use that attack to be able to incite its own members. And then we have those who spread rumors and conspiracy theories, whether it's on purpose or they just believe it. In the minutes after the Westminster Bridge attack, we had hoaxes, but it, um, messages out, but it was a hoax or a false flag attack. And even after the fire in Notre Dame Cathedral, there was lots of um, messages circulating that it was really a terrorist attack, but we've just been covering it up. And then finally, there's what I think is one of the most concerning things, is third-party agitators, in particular Russian influence. Russian influence campaigns to deliberately try and distort the, the communication landscape after a terrorist attack. After we saw this in the Westminster Bridge attack, and there was a famous picture of a Muslim lady on the phone, and she was circulated, 
and it was her allegedly walking past the victims on the bridge and not paying any attention to them. In reality, she'd just spoken to them. But researchers at Cardiff University managed to show how this was circulated by a whole load of Russian sock, sock puppets. On the one hand, putting out the narrative, isn't this disgraceful, this is what we come to expect from Muslims. But then also, a whole lot of sock puppets putting the other side. Actually, no, you can't say that. That is wrong to say this. And the whole idea was to generate this argument online and polarize the debate, which is completely manufactured by Russian sock puppets. I'll, I'll wrap up and end it there. And our central point is, with all these different actors competing to shape the meaning formation process after a terrorist attack, unless the police and emergency services actually play a role in having a post-incident communication campaign, we are surrendering that communication place to potential malignant actors. Okay, great. Thank you guys so much for your contributions. So with that, we're going to, um, I'm going to ask a question to each of you, and then we're going to open it up to the audience. So uh, for Florence to begin, um, in the context of counterfinance, what do you think that governments can really do to improve accountability and sort of mitigate uh, the effects of unintended consequences, especially given the, the nature that terrorism financing is changing? Um, in, in part because of existing rules and, and laws, uh, to see a lot of these smaller transfers, you know, below $5,000 in the U.S., for example, below $10,000 internationally. Uh, any comments on that? Yeah, well. Sure. So to start with the unintended consequences, um, and I think particularly in counter-terrorist financing, that's really affected civil society, peace building, humanitarian and human rights actors who desperately need to send funds to conflict zones or, or, or the like. And banks see that really outside of their risk zone and, and they shut their services down. And we see a whole raft of consequences from staff not getting paid on the ground to whole programs getting shut down. And it's, it's gone around in circles and it's really been born out of poor policy and recommendation that happened post 9-11. There's been more conversations that are being had and, and more groups trying to tackle the issues, primarily because the civil society actors came together and kind of pushed their voices forward. So some of the wording has been changed, and even in a recent UN Security Council resolution, there's acknowledgement of um, the need for humanitarian aid. But the problem is that banks are rational actors, and they will kind of, you know, they're not being told to do something, and they're being told to employ a risk-based approach. So they're closing programs down. So I think that the, the question that needs to be asked is what can governments do more to, um, to mitigate those issues? And at the moment, uh, I don't personally believe that's happening, and, and that's why I see this parallel in the communication service provider space, that if you know, regulations are created quickly, quickly and reactively and don't acknowledge the potential unintended consequences, the same thing may happen. And people can blame private sector and they can say that the civil society actors are, are at fault, but it has to be that government level statement that is clarified. And on your point about the changing nature of terrorism finance, um, again, that's something that, that we think about a lot, um, particularly as the policies that were designed post 9-11 were reacting to large amounts of money moving through the financial system, but that was potentially an anomaly. Um, whether or not kind of small cell finance is even that new remains to be seen. But again, uh, policy needs to, to be changed and reflect that. And I think the narrative that um, the private sector can cut off the funds of terrorism, given the small amounts of money, is, is a false narrative. Um, and similarly, in the, the communication service sector, that they can cut off all forms of terrorist content or stop terrorism when, as we've discussed, there's online, but there's offline radicalization that's clearly critical. So next, we're going to turn to Uri. So getting policymakers, lawmakers, practitioners, uh, I think practitioners are really the, the ones with the most uh, pragmatic and sort of hands-on uh, entry point to the conversation. But to have a genuine proportional rule of law-centric conversation about things like policy, legislation, regulation, and even partnerships can be really, really hard. So in your experience, how, how do you overcome this barrier and, and get them to communicate using the same language? Um, and how sort of can we make sure we're pushing past the conversation 
and the cries to go further and faster and instead replace it with real uh, conversations about um, enforcement of terms of service using different methods beyond content moderation and being able to get into the really practical side of things. I'm not sure that I know how to answer the question, uh, but definitely, definitely something to be done. Talking, 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 sitting in places like we are sitting now, projects like uh, we are doing in uh, ICTRP, uh, projects that are being initiated by the EU, by the EU uh, involvement of tech companies together with law enforcement agencies, together with people from the academic world, uh, those things step by step are uh, proving to work. Uh, something else maybe it has to do also with the financing uh, or preventing terrorism fin financing. I, I, I think that this sector of preventing terrorism financing is the most advanced in terms of cooperation, uh, uh, both international one and between the national and private uh, sector. Actually, uh, let's face it, banks are being used as the long arm of the security uh, entities in the countries based on the FATF uh, recommendations, if it not regulations. Uh, but the idea behind it is that it's not only preventing terrorism fundraising, but rather uh, preventing money laundering, which both are being uh, or staying in the same institutes all over the world, in the national institutes. Preventing terrorism fundraising and preventing money laundering are the same, the same exactly, the same entities are working on it, and the same banks, lawyers, and accountants in some of the countries are working as well. So I do think that uh, we should learn from um, this sector, at least on the cooperation side. And this gives me a lot of hope, because if we are cooperating together and coming together and convening, at least that gives us a baseline to really develop the right lexicon for communicating effectively with each other in cross-industry. So thank you. Um, so Alistair, uh, this is the great opportunity where I get to pursue my lifetime career of talking about TSA's Instagram <laughs> in, in, a, in a panel presentation. So just for background, what this tool does is, is TSA itself talks about stuff on a daily basis. What do they find and what do they use? So on a more concrete level, how can government agencies uh, and institutions begin this both pre- and post-incident communication? especially when governments themselves are often the ones to be quick to say, we need further action, we need you to respond, we need it down further faster now. Um, so how can governments start to use these tools uh, to really advance the right conversation? Um, the first thing is really just um, a sea change in perspective because communication is really just seen as a tool that's used for prevent. And actually, that actually, you know, once the attacks happen, it's tend to think, well, that's, it's happened now. All we can do is um, take the victims to hospital and we can just try and rebuild and collect rubber. And actually, the communication space is still active and you can still restrict the impact of it has afterwards. Um, and it's just conceptualization. And it's in terms of, you know, it's a different type of communication that needs to happen in the minutes afterwards, to the hours, to the days, to the weeks and the months afterwards. You know, we're talking about months afterwards, what we can do to um, help um, communities come back together or to reduce the impact of hate crimes afterwards, whereas in the immediate um, aftermath, we're talking about essentially public safety. What can we do to, um, um, you know, to reduce the impact immediately of that attack? Great. Thank you for your comments. We're going to open up to the audience. Oh, no questions. We solved it all. <laughs> okay. I can also keep going. Right here. Hi, thank you very much. Um, my name is Bill Sweeney. I uh, teach at American University a little bit and have done a variety of things in my uh, past. Uh, I think a central question is 
uh, people run for office to either do something or to occupy the office. Many of them, fortunately for us, run for office to do something. Um, that's going to result in either legislation or regulation. And I'm curious as to what your forecast is as to what the platform companies, uh, social media, whatever, is facing. Um, I agree with the model of financial regulation in some regards, but that was born out of a variety of crises and government in a variety of places had to do something, right? Because there are a variety of abuses going on um, and things which endanger the societies under new rules. Uh, do you see a force that is going to, uh, this type of cooperation discussion is important, but does it stop the political imperative to do something? Um, you know, that's, that's why Christchurch is so important in, in this space, but I, I'd like your reactions to whether or not you can just uh, think that this is enough. I'll take a first stab at that. Um, no, I certainly don't think that you can replace regulation and government and international action with public-private collaboration. I think we'd always argue that it's a useful complement when you're building regulation in the first instance. But I, I think you know, the writing is already on the wall in terms of, you know, look at European Commission regulations, meetings at the G7. We have our own white paper in the UK. There's been German regulations last year and you know, various degrees, but, but they kind of follow the same model of, of um, discussions around fines and content removal. And I think that's inevitable, but I think it's about complementing that with a sensible discussion and bringing in, as I've mentioned a lot, public-private dialogue that's um, complementary and voluntary, but tries to reach as many actors as possible. I think the, the more that governments immediately go in with the stick, the less companies may come to the table. Maybe they fall outside of the regulatory scope, and that could be potentially more dangerous. So I think that those things have to work alongside to get together, and I would never... Um, Advocate, advocate kind of not needing any regulations at all. But I think the more clearly we can define and work with the whole sector in the first instance so as not to design bad regulation, which we've seen in the counter-terrorist financing sector. And that's why it's been so fascinating kind of sitting on that side now in the counter-terrorist financing world in the UK where we have this public-private working group called the Joint Money, La Money Laundering Intelligence Task Force. Um, and I sit on the expert group of that, so I don't see any operational information. But even that expert working group brings in you know, actors such as myself and other experts and law enforcement with the private sector, where they can have a really open discussion about the important issues um, that they see in terms of growing trends, whether that's you know, the rise in you know, extreme right-wing actors, whether that's virtual currencies, I mean, you name it. And that doesn't um, prevent the, the necessary regulations that banks still have to come under. But to me, the most interesting and more effective solutions come when all of those actors are at the table. So I think they, they need to come hand in hand. Right here in the front. Um, hi, I'm David Chari. I'm a director of the Counterterrorism Executive Directorate. You know us as CTED. Um, and first, I want to welcome and congratulate the, um, the new forum, the Global Research Network on Terrorism and Technology. We already tweeted that officially, so you could retweet that on our <laughs> website if you wish. Um, Proactively using communications. To think about <laughs> communication. Um, I have a, a, a question to all of you, and um, you, you spoke about, and we speak throughout the day about public-private partnership, but you all touched on three different um, areas of public-private different uh, partnership, and I can see in each of them big differences. Um, there is a huge difference between cooperation with the, with, the, with the banking sector to cooperation with the content uh, companies. So one big um, exam difference could be uh, First Amendment issues that don't touch on uh, almost on, uh, on banking sector. And I could see that also in post-crisis um, development. So what differences do you see between each of the sectors? Um, second, who could be the players for each sector. We focus today about uh, on the internet companies, but when it comes, for example, to post-crisis uh, communication, I could see much more importance to the role that mayors can play, to the role that religious leaders can play, to the role that the fire department can play in making sure that um, 
the, the, the public gets it right. And then lastly, and sorry for bombarding you with so many questions because these are questions that we are dealing with them and I'm just throwing them at you. Um, as public sector, we're not necessarily interested in cooperating with every private company. We have also our own limits. Uh, there are companies that are not committed to protection of human rights. There are companies that are selling their products to governments and uh, in ways that is harmful to human rights. Um, there are companies that um, do not control uh, exactly what even they're selling. So what would be your advice to governments on, uh, or to the UN, I would say, on which companies should we uh, cooperating with and which should we say, thank you, but no thank you? Um, I'll do the easy question. Um, I, I think you're, you're right. Um, there's so many different partners, and talking about post-incident communication, everyone has their part to play in terms of um, whether it's the uh, emergency services, the fire service, the police, local government, mayors, um, but also the, what, the traditional media and social media, and we need to be able to have frameworks in which everyone plays their part in um, and knows how to respond rather than trying to work out on the day. But also, it, the public has their role to play. And part of it is also educating the public on what to do after an attack and, and what to do, how to use social media in the wake of an attack as well. And so it's about really collective responsibility of all of us. And, um, and this goes through um, every part of CT, really. Often we tend to sort of hypothecate it out to one or two people's responsibility. But it, these are, are wicked problems where there's no one person who can solve anything, and it's always about how can we get the maximum amount of players to play their role in this. Yeah, fully appreciate your comments about um, not, not perhaps wanting to partner with certain actors who have less democratic principles. Maybe they don't uphold human rights. And of course, you know, the financial sector is not directly comparable to communication service providers. Um, but there, there remain interesting parallels. I think, of course, you know, there are legal obligations that the financial institutions have, and they don't have to deal with issues around freedom of speech. But, as I think I've already said, there's nothing to prevent a more open conversation that doesn't involve that kind of high-level operational data that would maybe enhance the sort of tech world's ability to contextualize um, threats. It's very difficult for me to say where you draw the line in terms of who the UN should be engaging with. Um, it's obviously great that we have the GIF CT that, you know, has this sort of bigger network, but as we've said, it's only 14 companies, so we do need to think creatively about how we reach other companies in different parts of the world with potentially different um, terms of service, or maybe they have no terms of service. But there needs to be a way of including them in a conversation, but perhaps, of course, not sharing that kind of you know, close information, as I've suggested. I think that uh, uh, the financial sector is uh, regulated uh, quite deep comparing with other sectors uh, that you mentioned. But um, the common part is that the private sector has one important rule or one important goal in its money. And the carrot and stick uh, measure can work as it works in the financial sector, beside the regulations uh, or next to the regulations, we have also uh, punishment for those that are not following uh, the regulations. HSBC paid uh, 1.9 billion US dollar here in the US for not following the regulations. And I suppose that um, any uh, private or any, any, any company in the private sector uh, should be in situation that if not following the rules, the regulations, it will be the same. The question is what we are going to regulate. And as long as there is a cooperation, as long as uh, the private sector uh, is dealing with the things that need to be uh, dealt with, and I'm talking about the private, not about the municipalities or law enforcement agencies, I don't think that there will be any other solution rather than to force them to cooperate. 
add a short point. And Florian mentioned um, terms of service. The big elephant in the room is that the internet has largely been regulated, in terms of social media content removal, is being regulated by using the terms of service of companies. Material gets taken down of Facebook and Twitter because it violates their terms of service. Now, there are companies out there whose terms of service say, we don't take anything down. And um, how are we going to regulate those companies as they proliferate who are not going to, as the nature of term of service, take things down? How are we going to regulate that? That's going to force governments to actually take direct action. And to sort of begin wrapping things up, because I know that, oh, do you have one more question? We could do one more question, since it's close. Uh, 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 well, um, uh, so the question I would have, one of the things that's been interesting to me about this panel is that all the presenters are based outside the U.S., um, and yet all of the companies, or most of the ones that we're talking about, are American companies, uh, which gets very tricky when it comes to regulation. Uh, and so I was wondering if you see any tension there, and, and if, if so, um, uh, what you make of that tension. If I understood correctly the question, I think that the answer should be uh, a kind of organization like the FATF. It must be international one, the only one that can have uh, a kind of jurisdiction that will influence uh, the national regulations. I, mean, I think the major tension comes under in America, America's approach to free speech, where Very limited things get taken down because of that, and um, it's quite different to the approach in Europe. Um, so, I mean, if you can imagine if all the social media companies were based in, in a European country, if they were all based in the UK, so their primary legislation was, say, British legislation, you'd have a very different um, approach to what could be or could be online. And I think I'll just end on the point of saying, you know, of course there are, there are different national tensions but clearly the companies that we're talking about they have footprints all over and until we kind of come to a more harmonized approach um, you know these conversations are going to keep happening and you know everyone has to be extremely cautious um, not only they're, they're operating under different jurisdictions but you know different definitions of a terrorist um, and some organizations uh, some countries that I've mentioned who've maybe got you know less focus on human rights so um, yeah, tensions will clearly continue. If you have the European Union going one day, we have the US going the other way. Um, so the more harmonized. I, I don't know if I'd go as far as saying we need another FATF. Um, I, I sort of am maybe a critical friend, and I think that they do good work, and they have done a lot for the financial sector, but um, there are steep inefficiencies there as well, and I, I wouldn't want to see it going fully that way for this space. And to sort of wrap things up, I sort of just want to pontificate and saying perhaps tensions are a really good thing if this is such a subjective problem to begin with uh, that one of us or one of our countries or one of our companies or sort of these these hard borders define uh, what what the outcome is going to be perhaps this is sort of a democratic process in its own way even if it's frustrating and abrasive and uh, really problematic in the meantime I think it's a really exciting opportunity to sort of say uh, there might not actually be one so we can allow these different challenges to uh, exist and we're going to confront them as they arise so to wrap up for this conversation um, on that very broad observation um, I think it's really about looking at even within our, our own states and our own problem sets do we have the mandates to seriously talk about uh, legislation, regulation, and what partnerships we could really explore. Uh, in the U.S. alone, we've had a lot of great ideas, but very limited follow-through, in, in part because we, we really chain ourselves by limiting our, our mandates and not taking it seriously. Um, so these are questions that we need to really look at critically as, as governments uh, and other practitioners and not just sort of pivoting to look at, at technology providers. So uh, the next panel will not be live streamed, um, but the last one will be. And to sort of head into this break, I want to thank all of our panelists for their great contributions. And we'll begin again at 3.20. Thank you. Thanks for watching. Be sure to like and subscribe for more videos from Brookings.